Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Be Beautiful Adaptive Warrior. Today, I am honored with my guest that I have. She has, she honored me about 10 months ago on her podcast, but today we are speaking with Ronnie Sasaki. And what is so amazing about her, besides the fact that she is um, just a powerhouse of a woman, she is also a, uh, a gold medalist, bronze medalist in uh, para alpine, if I'm not mistaken, skiing. Yes. She competed in the 1992 um, Winter Olympics. She is, besides that, an entrepreneur, an author, a speaker, you name it she does it. And I am so excited because you and I've only talked really the one time when you interviewed me, um, you got to hear my story. I cannot wait to delve in to hear <laughs> what's inspired you, where you came from, what your background is, and just to get it in your words, because, you know, I can read about you, but I want to hear about it from the woman herself. So welcome <laughs> to the show, Ronnie. Well, thank you. It is really fun to be be with you again on your show yeah. and it's fun to be a guest instead of being the interviewer I get to be the interviewee which I'm looking forward to that well great well we are excited to have you here um, again for those of you that have been listening or maybe if you're new it is limb loss limb difference awareness month and last year at this time I was honored to speak to a bunch of people to help me through my amputation but with this this week's uh, guest with Ronnie um, we get to hear, um, I usually have talked to people and know a lot of people with, that have gone through amputation, mostly due to medical condition or accidents, but Ronnie, your story is different. Can you yeah. kind of just delve into your story, where you came from your childhood, what that was like? Yeah. I, I don't consider myself an amputee, although I did have my foot amputated when I was six years old. But the problem was my foot was where my knee should be. I was born uh, missing half of my right leg wow. and what's called a PFFD, which is the initials for proximal femoral focal deficiency. Try saying that wow. as a kid growing up. <laughs> And what it means, <laughs> what it means is I was born without the middle half of my right leg. So I had my, my leg from the knee down, but it was attached up at the hip. And my hip is kind of messed up too, rather than a kind of a ball and socket joint. It's a, mm. like a flipper joint. Right. My right leg swings back and forth. And so I was, I had the foot from the knee down. My leg was perfect essentially. Wow. And they decided to amputate the, the foot when I was six so that I could fit into a prosthetic leg a little bit more streamlined. Wow. And it ended up being a really good decision because I've worn a prosthetic leg. You know, when I was born, I was born in the early 60s and we called it disability or crippled, which I don't have mm -hmm. a problem with any of that birth defect. None of those terms bother me. I kind yeah. of heard limb difference for the first time about a year ago and I yeah. I laughed. So, you know, just <laughs> kind of tell them. Well, it is different, one. but yeah, um, right? Yeah. Terminology <laughs> has definitely changed. Yeah, I, I, I didn't seem to have too much of a problem with being born with a disability and I still don't. Um, my leg certainly is different. And I walk, I walk with a very unique sort of a, a limp, if I can say the word limp anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of have a bit of a drunken stagger. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if somebody like you who's had your leg amputated, even though you're above the knee, and I'm I would be considered above the knee as well, you probably don't walk with nearly as much of a kind of a swinging limp as I do because of the way that my hip is designed, I like to call it. Okay. And okay. So that's, I grew up with one leg, grew up learning how to fit in, <laughs> learning right. how to be normal. That was always my biggest goal as a kid was not wanting to be the, the kid that stuck out, the kid that everybody stared at, even though I was, Yeah. and I was certainly different. You say limb difference. Yeah. I was right. considered different as a kid. Oh, I so. bet. I bet. Well, and I can't, I can't even fathom the day and age that that was going on and, and how prosthetics have changed, how <laughs> the world's view of, um, you know, para athletes. I mean, that just boomed even in the last several years where there's, you know, it's yeah. more televised and there's more, I mean, there's more awe and, and inspiration coming from it versus like the looks or the, yeah. you know, you're not the same. So yeah. 
you were six when they decided to amputate that foot, right? You said, and yeah, make that they change. Had hoped, yeah, they had hoped that maybe in my lifetime, they could insert a bone into the leg mm-hmm. and elongate it, perhaps correct it somehow. And pretty much decided by the time that I was six, that if that were to happen in my lifetime, uh, it was going to be a long ways out and that I would be better off to be, to just fit very well into a prosthetic leg with the foot. They always had to, to form out the leg in the front. Mm -hmm. If you you can picture it, I I know you, instead of just having a nice skinny stump, so to speak, I don't, one word I don't like is the word stump. I've always called, I just don't like that word. It's like phlegm. It's one of those words, you know, just sort of, it just doesn't sound good. Right. Yeah. I've always called my leg, my, my little leg, which is probably not much better, but that's just always (laughs) what it's been to me. My little leg, um, but the foot stuck out in the front. So they always had to form the the prosthetic leg as a, with a big lump on the front for my foot to slide into. So having that amputated and they left my heel. So I have really nice, good um, tough skin. Oh, right. Um, on the end of my leg, it made it so that I could just look so much better. I looked more normal. Yeah. And when, when I was 16, they removed the knee joint because the knee stuck out in front of the hip, which made this big, huge bubble sort of yeah. on the front of my hip. And I mean, what teenage girl wants a big old bubble on the front? Right. Up. Oh, we just, up. Oh. Are you? Oh, there you go. We lost you there for a minute. Oh, am yeah. I back? Yeah, you are. Well, they they took that big bubble out. I live out in the country. Oh, so okay, that will. Yeah, internet. it says internet connection is unstable. That's kind of frightening. So we'll see what we can get okay. through. Audience, stay tuned. Yeah, don't don't go away. Don't go um, away. They removed the knee joint, smoothed out my hips, which was such a huge bonus for me. Oh yeah. Um, as a teen, 16 year old young woman to sort of start to look more normal. Right. And so between the foot and the hip, um, I kind of felt more whole. I, it's funny though. I remember being on crutches after I had my hip surgery, I had to completely relearn how to walk again. Mm. And I, I, I was terrible at it. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing. Most people learn to walk when they're two right. or one or whenever it was, because I, I really had a hard time relearning to walk and it's because I wanted to look good. Isn't it funny how we're so worried about what people are thinking of us. And I didn't yes. want to look ridiculous trying to learn to walk. So I use my crutches a lot. And when mm. I was at the mall or out in public with my crutches on and my artificial leg, people just thought I was recovering from an injury. Uh. And it was so amazing how different they looked at me not with the same kind of pity or the stare of, oh my goodness, what happened to her? It was just more like, well, hey, did you twist your ankle or, yeah. you know, are you, did you hurt your knee? knee? accident, yeah. Completely different. And it reminded me of the movie, uh, old movie with Kristen McNichol, where she, she had something wrong with her leg and she put a cast on it and went up to the ski area. I think it was something just, yes. I don't know what it, just like I me or something. It. Yes. She went up to the ski area with this cast and pretended that she had hurt her leg skiing and everybody treated her completely different. Yeah. And that's the way I felt when Isn't I was that, on crushes. You know, it's, I, I, I really, and I can't even wrap my head around it because, you know, I've been able to embrace what happened to me, um, was older, wiser, right. Um, in a different generation of acceptance, um, in the world and, and then quite frankly, quite proud of what I had gone through mm-hmm. to get to where I was and I was going to make sure I rose. But when you're talking about, you know, and I do have a, a few friends where their, their children had cancer and they've had, they've, they've got a prosthetic now. And, and, you know, even to them, you know, you're, you worry about acceptance. I mean, that's what childhood and being in school and all those years or formative mm-hmm. years are just about where do you fit in and who are you in the scheme of your community? Like when you're yeah. a group of friends and, and the people that you spend all day with at school. And I, I, I can't even, I'm, I'm visualizing you as a six-year-old going into like kindergarten, first grade mm-hmm. and, and they don't have filters, <laughs> you no. know, I mean, right. They just want to <laughs> know everything and maybe not out of rudeness, just because they, they are just curious about the world. Right. So do yeah. you feel like because of all those times that that was really kind of ingrained in you each year of school starting new people, 
new school from middle school, maybe to high school, to college, did, did you, did you battle with that a lot? That identity, that oh, totally. confidence? I, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I had friends. So I, I, I definitely had friends, um, in every phase of school, but I just, I struggled with fitting in PE was a huge challenge trying okay. to do what all the other kids could do and prove that I could do it. And just, I, I had such a strong desire to be normal. I was from the generation where we really wanted to fit in. We wanted to have this, yeah. I mean, there were still children who were crippled or born with a disability. These are terms that were used in that time right. where, where they were kind of hidden away. Mm -hmm. And yet I never was. My parents treated me completely as if I was a, a child with two legs, including um, I broke my knee when I was 12 ice skating and I was in a full leg cast. And my brother and I, we alternated doing dishes every night. And when it was my turn to do dishes, you know, don't think for a second that I got sympathy because I, my leg was in a cast. I, <laughs> it was uh -huh. like they prop me up to the sink. You so that I it. could, I could keep going with my, my chores. So my parents definitely, you know, they didn't, they just treated me like a normal kid, which worked out great. So I was, went to school with mostly, you know, kids with non-disabilities. There weren't a whole lot of us in the school. Mm -hmm. And, and that was my, I, so I got to fit in with them and try to prove myself. And so I kind of, I think I always, I don't know if kids are born with this, but I was born with this desire to, to show that I could do everything that they could do driven. I was very driven. Yeah. Now I didn't succeed in, at least in athletics, which kind of led me to this weird secret fantasy, if you will, to be an athlete, to be mm -hmm. good at a sport and to kind of say, Hey, look, I showed you guys that I could do this. And mm -hmm. that really pushed me to keep trying different athletic endeavors. And some of them were pretty comical. <laughs> and I, I fell into skiing sort of by accident, but, um, no kidding. Well, and, okay. So was, tell me, yeah. did your parents ski? Were they skiers? Did no. they push you that direction? No, where we did you grow up? I grew up in the Northwest Washington state. We were snowmobilers. We snowmobiled on Mount St. Helens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, okay. You know, it, it blew up in 1980 and we, we had a, my parents had a cabin up there, which is still there by the way, but my uncle owns it now. And every weekend we were up at the mountain snowmobiling. Holy and God. I loved snow. I loved um, winter. And yeah. I was really good on one leg. I had really good balance. If there was a hopping event <laughs> in PE, well, then everybody wanted me on their team. Nobody wanted me on yeah. their team otherwise, but it was right. a hopping right. event that I was like the star. Yeah. So I had really good balance. And I, I had seen some one-legged skiers on television and different things. And um, I thought, hmm. Maybe I could ski. Maybe that's something I could do. So we tried to find somebody that could teach me. And it was weird. Like nobody even had heard of it, one-legged skiers. And yet I knew they were out there. Yeah. And we made enough calls that somehow my name and phone number got into the hands of an organization called SOAR, which was Shared Outdoor Adventure Recreation. It was, uh, I don't think it's in existence any okay. longer. We do have an organization in the Oregon called Oregon Adaptive Sports. And this is probably real similar okay. to that. Um, they had an instructor named Jan who also had one leg. And one day, just out of the blue, it seemed like she called me up, said, oh. you want to learn how to ski? And, you know, after all these, these, you talked about the childhood and wanting to fit in and, and yeah. I, yes, I was definitely teased and I was kind of shy and, it, as a teenager convinced that nobody was going to like me because I had one leg and it was going to ruin my life. And I looked funny. I walked funny. And wow. But when she called me up that day and said, do you want to learn to ski? I was so excited because I wanted the lift ticket because <laughs> all of the kids that were popular in my school were in the ski club um, and they had lift tickets yep. on their jackets. Yep. And I, I wanted one of those lift tickets on my jacket because I just knew that that was that would, again was going to be proof. It's like a status. <laughs> look you thing. guys, look what I can do. I can go yep. skiing too, just like you. And it was totally a status thing. And we ended up not getting a lift ticket on the first day of skiing. I was so crushed. And um, <laughs> but eventually, you know, I did get a get that you know coveted lift ticket. <laughs> How old were you when she reached out to you? I was 17. So okay. in, you know, modern day sports, you know, if you don't start skiing or learning your sport at a very young age, it's almost impossible to, oh. to break into it. Isn't that crazy? It is. But the beauty, 
the beautiful thing about Paralympics and para sports, and um, we didn't call them para sports back then, we just right. called them disabled sports, yeah, um, is there's less people competing, and yeah. it, it opened up the door for a 17 year old girl to decide, I want to be a racer, and in college, start yeah. learning how to race and training full time and being able to advance through the ranks in a way that a person with um, no disabilities with all their limbs, no limb differences, how's that? Right. No right. limb differences uh-huh. would never be able to do. Oh, not at that age, no. And no, because it, I would have been way too old. Right, so. that's incredible. And so how many years did you put in before mm-hmm. Did you, well, how, okay. So how long did it take you to start competing? Cause obviously your first competition wouldn't have been the Olympics. So no, my first competition was the same woman that Jan who asked me if I wanted to learn how to ski, asked me if I wanted to enter my first race. And I was like, no way there's, I can't even ski without falling yeah. uh, one whole run. And she told me not to worry about that because they would, they divided us out into classifications. So she yeah. said I would be competing against beginner one-legged women skiers. And I thought, well, okay, you know, that, I guess that I qualify yeah, I'm right, a beginner right. still, I am one-legged and I'm a woman. So yeah. I ended up competing in this race and winning. I guess I was, I always say I was the best of the worst. <laughs> so uh. <laughs> basically I made two runs on each day without falling, <laughs> which well, that's that good. in itself put me, put me towards the top. But in a way I won these little teeny tiny medals. And in my efforts to, in my efforts to fit in, in school and, and be like all the other kids, I had never really won anything in athletics other than what they would, I called the booby prize, which is the, um, most inspirational. I always got the most inspirational, (laughs) which to me was defined as the best bench warmer. By golly, yeah. Ronnie, she warmed that bench with a smile and yeah. because she had one leg, but she was just so inspirational. I know. But we, but she just, you know, she couldn't run to save her life. And therefore we didn't really want her out on the court or we didn't want her out in the right. field because she was going to slow our whole team down. Right, but right. She'll be inspirational. Well, um, of course. So, yeah. So these, these little tiny medals for being the best of the worst, they meant a lot to me. And I decided mm. that I was going to pursue ski racing with everything that I had. And I began at that moment to find a coach, find a way to train um, and, and make it. The beautiful thing too is, is it, it was ski racing was making it for um, those of us with limb differences and blind skiers and, and yeah. all different types of disabilities. It was, it was, there was a whole, I guess, a channel, if you will, to succeed. Yeah. There was the Paralympics. There was the U.S. disabled ski team, as we called it back then. So you could actually work towards something. Yeah. And it was becoming competitive. It was becoming less social and more of a, an athletic endeavor where people were training yeah. full time to yeah. achieve their goals and to move up in the ranks. And I got to ride that wave. Yeah. of those that came before me and, and jump into it and become a serious athlete. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and with you being born into that, that lifestyle, if you will, and people like me, or if you get someone that, that becomes an amputee later in life, like, you know, later in life. Um, <laughs> yes. The fact is, is that those dreams aren't even out of reach anymore for me. Mm-mm. Like at my oh. age, because I started skiing about 17. My husband actually taught me how to ski. My family was not a ski family and um, Midwest. So Midwest skiing was ice, not snow. <laughs> you heard a lot of it as your blades were going across ice and you were scared to death. But it's kind of interesting to see that there are so many opportunities that I think when I, when I picture the whole, like our, our collective whole. And you see that there are so many people that are so traumatized by what has happened to them in their life, midlife, that it does bring joy and hope and a competitive edge to those that have always been athletes or wanted to be athletes, a whole new ball game to let them feel the power of doing something good with their life after a tragedy. And I, and I love that. And I love how much it's grown and, and no dream is out of reach anymore. 
you know, mm-hmm. I feel even more blessed because that's there for me if I chose to go that route. Um, but you know, 50 year old woman, that has been a housewife, a mother, two legs, two arms. There was nothing really breakthrough special that I could have competed for the Olympic team on a normal basis. Um, I know how you ski because I've seen pictures and I have skied that way, but can you take us through what skiing looks like for one leg? Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, you have to have a really strong leg. Yes, you do. Oh my goodness. As I, as I've gotten, if I, I'm getting closer to 60 and I still ski for fun and I'm telling you, cool. that's the first thing that starts to go away is the strength. And, um, oh. so, but yeah, I ski on one leg. I, we, we call ourselves three trackers, at least yep. we used to. And I use a normal ski, a normal boot and outriggers, which are simply forearm crutches of a certain style with short ski tips on the ends. And all those do really is provide a timing device and a bit of balance. Mm-hmm. Um, a good three, three tracker is not gonna hardly touch them down. <laughs> certainly not lean over them. We used to call people that bent over beginners, which we all are yeah. at one point in time, right? Paper yeah. clippers, because <laughs> yeah. they're all bent over, right. leaning forward on the outriggers. That is not how you really ski it. And the, yeah. the beautiful thing about a one-legged skier is, is we advance quicker early on because you, you skip the wedge. Most yeah. two-legged skiers start with kind of a pizza slice yep. um, formation for their skis, and then they, they go into parallel skiing. On one ski, you go immediately into parallel skiing. Yeah. Well, That's I guess you so could true. still slide, slide your tail around. That certainly happens quite a bit as a beginner as well. Oh, sure. But, um, so yeah, that's, that's the only difference is being on one ski yeah. and using the, the outriggers. And I, again, I've seen one-legged skiers that are fabulous, incredible skiers using poles. I have myself have skied with poles a time or two, but I'm going to tell mm-hmm. you straight up, I'm not good at it. And it's really, talk about strength. Whew, well, it yeah. takes even more strength. Um, and I've seen some now above the knee amputees who are skiing with two skis using a prosthetic leg to ski. And, yeah, and that I don't get. Remarkable. <laughs> well, you know, I think you have to have enough hip control. I don't know if it would work for me and a really yeah. good leg that's designed yeah. for that purpose. And, yeah. Um, yeah. But- well, no, and, and I agree. That is, um, I, I think I'm probably more still on the beginner side of that. I've only skied probably four times without rigors and it is. That is a quad exercise <laughs> beyond no other. Like it is an incredible, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I've skied all day after just a couple hours. <laughs> I mean, just yeah. beat down. Right. And you just really got to protect your knee. I mean, I got one knee now, you know, and that, that is a, probably one of my biggest fears is wiping out or getting someone that runs into me and taking yeah. out my good knee, you know, that's the last thing we yeah. need. Right. Well, I've skied for 40 years now and I have a very strong knee and I'm very grateful for that because yeah. um, it, it serves me well and and I can still go out and ski and have just a wonderful time enjoying myself. I don't race. Right. I haven't raced since I retired. and But I just ski for fun and it's such a beautiful sport to be able to enjoy at any level you're at, whether oh, you're an yeah. elite racer or whether you're a beginner. The fun thing about being a, a new skier or beginner is that you... It, every time is a new adventure. Every time it, maybe you learn something new yeah. and it's just like a wow moment. Like, oh, wow. I just, I just skied my first blue run or I just skied my first black diamond right. or I just felt the carving turn for the first time. And it was so incredible. Right. Um, you don't experience that as much later on. Right. No, and that's still true. Fun. That's true. So what, who, or what was inspirational on getting you past that, trying to figure out who you were and how you could shine, that you could achieve your goals when you were at that age in life. I mean, is that, you you talked about your own internal drive and you said, you don't know if you were just born that way or what. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot to that, but I do believe it's also your environment around you. Was there someone there that was really inspirational on on saying you Um, could? There was, you know, just, I think that the people that surrounded me, my family was really important to me. 
that always just let me try anything I wanted to and supported me that even, even when they thought, oh my goodness, what is she up to next? Mm -hmm. And like I had a great desire to be a cheerleader and I was terrible at making the, the jumps and the moves, but you know, they, my parents let me try and supported me and, right. and all that. So my parents definitely were huge. And I have to tell you though, I was, I was a person of faith, even at a young age, I had a very strong belief in God and I still do. And I came to the point as a young teenager where I, I thought that I was being cursed when I was younger. Like, why am I out of all the kids in the world born with one leg, am I cursed? And I flipped that it, because of my faith in God, I realized that he, maybe he created me the way I am for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Maybe I was born without a leg because I had this incredible purpose to fulfill as a person with one leg. I changed my belief. Instead of a curse, I began to see it as a blessing. And because of that faith and because of that support from my family, it, it just opened up the doors to possibilities. Like, okay, if God really did create me the way that I am, then what's out there? Right. And it's, it's funny, once you begin to open your eyes and look around, it's that whole idea when you get a new car and everybody else is all of a sudden driving the same car you are, right. you see the possibilities, you see what's out there. And, as, and all of a sudden, I was super in tune to what is next? What is next? What am, what's exciting out there? And so it was, it was very transitional, mm. that shift in faith that God did not curse me. God blessed me. Yeah. And I'm going to live my life that way. Instead. Ugh. I tell you what, our stories mirror so much in that background. I mean, <laughs> truly I couldn't, you know, I've, I was always born and raised Christian and, you know, always in church and everything. You become a parent, you really understand the miracle of birth. You start really clinging to your faith that, cause you know, you know, you can't raise these kids all by yourself, <laughs> especially when you right. don't know really what you're doing. You're just going <laughs> through the ropes and learning as you go on the job. Mm -hmm. But when this all went down for me, that was exactly the same thing. It kind of came back to, you know, that hindsight for me, it was mm -hmm. years of surgeries. And then we came to this point where I decided that this was the best route. And then I looked back and went, Oh, that was a sign. Okay. That was a sign. That was a sign you were prepping me. Cause I knew back when it first happened, there was no way I was prepared for this part of my journey yet. And, and I think it's so amazing if you can really, it's like a veil is um, uncovered your eyes and you see the reality of what's ahead of you. And then i i I tell people on my podcast, I feel like, you know, a lot of times I do my podcast and I said, it's my own therapy. Cause I get on and I talk about mm -hmm. things going on and then I get done. I'm like, ah, I feel better. This is good. I, you know, like I had to talk it out and I really kind of hope it, it helps one person, if not a handful, um, that maybe they see somebody, something going on with them that's paralleling. But yeah, I mean, I think faith, I, I honestly, I don't think I could be where I'm at if I didn't believe that there was a purpose in this design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it does, it, 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 it really opens up so many possibilities and a lot of joy actually, you know, cause yeah. I know it, it, you, I mean, you didn't stop you. Okay. You, now let's transition. You went in from skiing and did you, was that the one Olympics that you competed at 1992? Yeah, it was the only one I was pregnant at the time. And so oh. I went, I jumped from competitive skiing and for 10 years to starting my family. Okay. And then I started a business after I had my second child, I started a business Okay. and it was just kind of one thing after the other. So, like I said, I never really raced again after I retired from skiing. I, I just recreational skied and still okay. do and intermingled that with all the other stuff in my life. And Right. You know, raising kids, I had three kids in five years, which I know there are many women who have had more in that short period of time. But for me, that was enough. And yeah. It yeah. was a huge, huge challenge. Oh, I said yeah. that, you know, it's much harder. It's much harder and more rewarding than ski racing, but nobody gives you medals. Yeah. No. <laughs> nobody puts you up on the podium mm -hmm. when you've had a good mom run. You know? No, like, right. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to write a newspaper article about you or put you on the news <laughs> yeah, because your your child is potty trained now. Yeah. <laughs> <Woo! It's> like, <laughs> I know it's your own little so. pat on the back and you're like, I can do this. I can do this. So, so tell me then the transition from being, um, fulfilling that dream that you had to be competitive mm-hmm. and an athlete to win is incredible. That's so amazing. And you transition into being a mom and, and living that life, an entrepreneur was your goal at this point, based on your faith comment was your goal at this point. Now, were you seeing that you should use what you've gone through to get out there in the world, to speak to people, to, to help others navigate what, where were you at in that transitional phase because obviously it's probably as a speaker and and i've seen your book and everything that that you actually was on amazon and you obviously are speaking to that kind of group and you're inspiring but what was that transition like was it straight into that or were you thinking more how do i make an income right now just based on me as a person no i actually started speaking when i was 16 and Mm. i fell into that strictly by accident i was working at a summer camp for the entire summer when I was 16 years old. And the last night of the camp, they had a big bonfire that they would start and all the campers would gather around and sing. It was kind of those kumbaya kind of moments that yeah. you would envision at a camp. Right. And the camp director came to me and asked me to speak. There was a, we had junior high, a couple of junior high camps that came in different weeks and then a couple of high school camps. And I mean, I was in high school. So I was essentially a peer of these campers, even though Mm -hmm. I was working at the the camp, but he asked me if I would be willing on the last night to share my story of being, of having one leg. And I wasn't a skier at that point. I wasn't a professional athlete, but I just had one leg. And I had, by then I had come to terms with it. I had, I believed very strongly that God made me for a purpose. And Mm -hmm. so he asked me to, to share that with these kids. And in the first I was so scared. <laughs> it was very scared, even though it was a very casual setting around right. fire. Um, but he asked me at the week, the next week, will you do it again? And then the next week, and will you do it again? And the next week, will you do it again? And I had up speaking at a teenage youth rally of about 800 students. Wow. The following six months that stemmed from my experience at that camp when I was 16. So I began to um, really have a desire to to share with other people, Mm -hmm. you know, if God made me unique for a purpose, Mm -hmm. he made you unique for a purpose too. And teenagers so much more, I think, than any other group of people struggle with that, struggle with who they are and, and why. Mm -hmm. And so at a very young age, God, I feel was able to use me to, to touch other people's lives and to help if nothing else, brighten their day for a few minutes. And so I began to speak more and more as time went on. And when I was ski racing, I wanted to go to Italy for a summer training camp. And it was, you know, enough money back then that it it was significant investment for me. So I went around speaking uh, to raise money for that. Wow. And so various times in my life, I I didn't even, because most of the time I never got paid to speak. It was only that time specifically where I asked to get paid because I was raising money specifically for a purpose. Um, But I continued to speak to groups when asked on the side throughout all of those years. And it was really only about five years ago where I decided, you know, maybe I should do a side business as a speaker. And that's when I wrote my book. And and I, I wasn't a writer. I'm still not a writer, even though I've got other books that I'm working on right now. Uh, to me, that was, it was more of a calling, like right. you know, write your story down, right. get it down on paper and, right. and just do it. It took me three years, three years. And wow, it was from that where I decided to begin to speak more and more. And I still primarily, I do a lot of events. Well, this was before COVID. <laughs> of course, COVID changed many, many things when it comes to events. Yeah. Um, no speaking kidding. corporately, altering my story to fit with goal setting and, and overcoming obstacles so that it could be used in the corporate world and for conventions and that type of thing. But my heart is really still to speak to, to um, religious organizations. I have a very strong faith message and I really love to share that. I'm currently going to seminary. I decided to go back to school, Good get my you. master's degree. 
Yeah. So that I can um, speak about other things too, which is really exciting. Right. And continue to grow and be educated and just pursue all that I believe God has for me. Yeah. I, I think even at age 57, he's not done. There's still some no. great things out there. Maybe not, not winning gold medals in the Paralympics anymore. And that's okay. Cause those young people out there doing that are pretty amazing. Oh, it's incredible. But, <laughs> but what's next? You know, what is right. the next thing right. out there? Right. Um, well, that's, I think that's so amazing. And I know that, you know, um, the dynamics of my podcast, um, like I said, I don't do a lot of speakers. A lot of times it's just me kind of talking my journey out, mm -hmm. you know, being real. Um, I, 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 my goal has always been to be very transparent. Um, after mm -hmm. looking, after becoming a new amputee and looking on social media to see what was out there, everybody seemed to know what to do and how to do it well. And I was like, and I'm really highly competitive, like to a fault. And mm -hmm. so I would see, you know, uh, you know, above knee amputee doing this or doing that. And I'm like, man, I'm never going to be able to do that. You know, now, how do you, so I started going, you know what, let's just start showing people what it's like to start. Like the first time I picked up a jump rope without my leg on, it looked like a elephant hitting the ground as hard as possible. Every jump. I'm like, where's your lightness? Like you look like you're 600 pounds jumping on the, you're going to break through the grass here. And so, you know, it was just I transparency. And I just, I wanted to be able to empower people to say, well, yeah, I'm like where she's at. I, and then, then I would show progression, right? Where have I come from and, and, and where am I at now? And it's a perfect no. And is it humbling? Yes. Cause I like to be good at what I do. So to show me in the process, and that's why I think people don't do it. Right. Cause it makes us look inferior or not good enough. <laughs> and so that was the reason I do. And when I want to have speakers on, especially this month, now that I've got a year of podcasting under my belt, I really wanted to find people that have done it but to look back and go, you know, what were, what were those hurdles? I think people don't realize, like you talked about the fitting of your prosthetic. You can do whatever you want. You can be as athletic as you want, but if that's not fitting great, everything hurts. Everything is out of sync. You're out of whack. You can hurt your hip. You can hurt your back. You can, you can just tweak stuff. What, when you were skiing, I'm, I'm curious because, you know, I've skied but I don't ski fast yet, yet. Um, is there anything that you went through that was really hard to handle when it came to struggles through those years or even now? What are some of the biggest struggles you're trying to get over? I mean, we know when you were younger, identity was a struggle. Yeah. Are there any physical or other internal struggles that you have had to try to head on with and overcome? Well, let me let me tell you a little story to answer that. And okay. hopefully I can then expand upon it. Yeah. Um, I think that having one leg more than anything else has taught me to be tough. And if I were to give advice to somebody new who has recently lost a limb, um, be tough, <laughs> yeah. be tough. When I started my business, my mother took me out to lunch. She's an incredible businesswoman, And she says, Ronnie, the first thing you need to learn is to have thick skin and, and just be tough. And so here's the story. When I would, would go hiking or walking or running or new sport endeavor, which there were numerous one right after the other, as I tried different things to see what was going to work for me, mm -hmm. I would get blisters, yeah. blisters on my little leg. And they were very painful. And what I learned, because the legs in the olden days were definitely different than they are now. And they wore blisters a lot. And yeah. the worst thing to do when I got a blister was to take my leg off and not wear it. And that's the first thing you would think you should do is, is right. take it off, give it a chance to breathe. But if there's a blister, that's because something is rubbing in a place that it's probably going to rub again. And the best thing you can do is to continue to wear it. And now I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not giving medical advice. So please, you know, do whatever you got to do. Duly this, noted. This is, a meta, this is a metaphor story. Okay. Yeah. Um, was to continue to wear the leg and build the callus up. Mm -hmm. 
And so that the next day that I go hiking, now I have a callus there and I don't get a cal- I don't get a blister in the same spot. Right. And I think you can get used to almost anything. And I've had to get used to numerous things with prosthetics that you just think I'm never going to get used to this. And a week later, after wearing it consistently, it's like, oh, sudden I don't even notice it anymore. I'm just, I'm so used to it. Yeah. So there's this toughness that builds up in us as we continue to work at it mm-hmm. and pursue it. And I call it build up that callus, so to speak. Right. It helps us overcome those obstacles because I still have one leg. I, every night I take my leg off, I put it on in the morning um, and I'm getting older. I really am. And there's times when I go to do something and I say to myself, Ronnie, you're going to have to admit that you just can't do the same things. And this has nothing to do with having one leg. I don't think but maybe <laughs> I just can't do the same things I used to yeah, do when I was right, in my thirties, right. twenties and thirties. I don't know. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, a toughness. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I can't do it this way now, but if it's really important to me, I'm going to find another way to do it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep figuring it out until I build up the callus and or can keep yeah. going and keep doing it. And I don't, I just think that there's a toughness. I think most of us tend to want to give up way too soon. Mm-hmm. The first sign of that blister, we take the leg off and right. take a, a week off. I'm going to take a week off and let this completely heal. Well, you've just lost a week of really good, yeah. purposeful, callous building as i call it yeah well and and, you know it's so well said the way you said it it, it, that hit home totally because every time you get a new socket there is a good and and my husband's been so great through all this because he'll tell me i'm like you know i'm I'm, i used to be excited to get the new sockets but now i know what's coming and he goes just remember it's like a week of eh and then you're on your way and i'm like i know (laughs) But, and then I'll be in the middle of it. And he goes, remember, you're, you're only like two days into the new socket. I'm like, I know, I don't want to wait any longer. Cause you, you even when a ill-fitting socket, you get used to it. So like if I shrunk, it was loose, but I got used to it and yeah. I know I need a new socket, but I don't want to go through all the pains and, and the wear and tear. And luckily knock on wood, I haven't really had the blister thing. I've had some rashes. Um, yeah, I'm a skin legs- fit. So it's right in there, right? Like there's no, I don't have anything blocking myself from my socket. There's it's, it is what it is. So basing on all that, that was amazing advice. I, and I, I think there might be twofold to that building calluses because I don't know if that's necessarily literal, but it could also be metaphorical as well. Right. Um, right. right. Like you have you to be tough just, in every area of our life. Right. It's just like, um, it is, it's a, it's, it's an emotional game. It's a mental game. It's a physical game. And I, I totally 100% agree with you. Sometimes you have to push through those hard moments, but that's the only way you can really build yourself up, build that character, build that callus mm-hmm. so that you can take on that world and take on the naysayers or take on the struggles you're going to face. And I do, I think probably one of my biggest concerns, and maybe you can speak to this as well is, and you touched on it is as we get older, things are hurting because normal things are hurting because right. of age and what age does. I have, my ultimate fear is going to be what's putting on my leg going to look like at 80. <laughs> I, I mean, cause I struggle getting my leg on now. Cause I have such a hard, I don't know how, are you skin fit? Are you a liner? What do you wear under your sock? Well, I've only had a liner for the past year, a little over a year. Prior to that, I wore a, a, a sock with a belt around my waist. So I mean, okay. talk about old fashioned, and I was happy with that. Totally happy with that. Yeah. And now I, I have a, I just got a new leg. My old leg was 15 years old. I don't get new sockets every few months because I don't need to. Well, okay. I say that right. Weight gain is a challenge. It, <laughs> And a woman in her fifties, let's just put it that way. Weight is, is a challenge. And I, oh my goodness. So, um, but I don't ask you, I have never interviewed another woman actually, (laughs) because the the people that come out end up being men, like my, all my doctors last year and a couple of the guys this year, but the struggle is so real. I I can't even explain it. The panic that sets in the day after having a great night out and your leg is so tight, you can't get it down inside your socket. There is a moment of gasp, right? And then you go weigh yourself. Do you weigh yourself often then? Or do you base it on just how you're- Every day. 
okay. every day. And I don't even need to weigh myself because I can tell you how my leg fits exactly yes. what my weight is. <laughs> That's how terrible I'm so intuitive. And it's been that way my whole life. I've, yeah. uh, uh, my sockets, um, particularly prior to having the, the liner with the suction fit, um, had a little bit of give to it because I could wear a thicker sock or a thinner sock right. if I, depending on how it yeah. was. But it still only allowed so much weight loss mm -hmm. or weight gain. I remember once being very thin and my leg was too big and it was literally slopping around, yes. even with the thick socks. And then when my weight started creeping up and it didn't seem to matter what I did, it was it was like, oh my goodness, now what am I gonna do? You know, it's I'm walking funny because my I'm not fully into the, yes. into the leg. I've had to watch my weight carefully. Many women do, right? It's kind of an obsession in our, our country, right. particularly. Um, but for me, even more so, because it wasn't just about looking good or fitting into those jeans. It was being able to walk comfortably. And so yeah. it, oh. I got a new leg a year ago because my old leg did not fit me. Now it needed to replace. It was 15 years old. That's incredible. But I probably would still be walking on it if I hadn't struggled yeah. for seven years to lose the weight that came on when I turned 50 that I hadn't been able to lose. And I'm just like, you know what? It's, it's been long enough. I'm going right. to get a leg that fits well. And That's so this incredible. one does. And I still get to watch my weight every day. Yeah. No. And so. I, I, I almost feel like it's almost obsessive um, because then there's times where I'm like, did I just put my leg in wrong? So I'll weigh mm -hmm. myself and I'm like, Okay. I'm like only within two pounds, but you really yeah. do feel it. And like I said, I'm skin fit. So there is no room up or down. There's no liner. Yeah. I can't add socks. That's what I used to have. Went to skin fit. I use a bag to draw my skin down in and out the hole of the valve and then close the valve. Mm. And I'm like, <laughs> there was a week or so. I think there was a podcast I did on it. Like panic. Like there you know, I, I watching everything I ate, I'm like, I got to get out and walk. But if your leg's not fitting right to get the exercise is really hard. Yeah. So <laughs> then it becomes all about the food. And then the more you think about what food you can have, the more you want to eat. Of course, of course. It's like, and it's like, why can't I just be a normal person who I can know, do whatever they want just, and get fat and nobody cares. I can still walk. <laughs> no, right? Although, you know, it's, that's not the case. I know that, but yeah, no, it, you know, it's, those true. things come through our minds sometimes and it, it just, you do. But, well, yeah, I call my um, mini pity parties that happen every once in a while. They don't happen yeah. often, but once in a while, I just need to throw one, usually in the shower <laughs> when I'm frustrated, and then I'm done. Yeah. And then we move and on. Don't get me wrong. I have those moments too. Just because I, I embrace having one leg as a gift from God, I, there's yep. still moments when I say, oh, why do I have to deal with this? Yeah. You know, I'm so, yeah. And, they can, they, they come, you know, they, they don't last long nowadays, no. which is really good to, to admit. Yeah. Um, I broke my arm. I broke my arm this past That's summer and right. had surgery on my elbow and could not put my leg on by myself. He talked about how do I get my leg on when you're, when I'm 80, my husband um, had to learn how to roll the liner, up my oh. little leg and how to get me into it every morning. Uh, otherwise I would have just not worn it. I would have been on crutches, but I had a cast, you know, clear up to my armpit oh. crutches didn't work very well. It was better to put my, have him help me put my leg on. And so we got to work through those things together and figure it out. And we did. Yeah. And, I mean, there's and it, 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 I guess if I'll just say this about my arm is it really opened my eyes to people who don't have an arm. And I began right? to be very grateful, very grateful for my arms and, so those kinds of things that remind us of all the good stuff we do still have. You know? Well, you know what? And, and it's those little things in those moments where you go, this is very difficult. You would never think about it. Like a lot of my friends, cause I, I mean, I don't know any other amputees here. I mean, not like genuinely friends with any other amputees that I hang in my circle. And so mm -hmm. there are things that they're like, really? And I'm like, you know, it's our day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Like you don't shower with your leg on. I'm like, no, I hop into my shower. I can't put my leg in the shower. You know, do you sleep with it? No, yeah. I don't sleep with it. That would be really uncomfortable, you know, but those are all yeah. the same questions I had before I became an amputee, which I think is kind of funny because now they're just commonplace. And, but yeah, I can't imagine next week. I actually have on uh, a Paralympian who was um, born without a uh, part of her upper arm, like part of her arm. And she'll be the first upper limb difference person I talked to. Mm -hmm. I've never met anybody. Um, so I'm excited to hear about that because 
yeah, I, you know, we take for granted, like, I think I'd rather have my leg gone than a hand. Yeah, I think so too. I've broken both my legs, my good leg and my little leg. Yeah. And I'll tell you, neither of those injuries sent me back nearly as much as breaking my arm. Has. Isn't that interesting? It's just, it's been incredible. I've never had an arm injury. I've always had good, solid arms. It's like, okay. Yeah. <sighs> well, I, you know, yeah, I think it's, a, it's, those are blessings though, right? Because it does give you a different perspective. It lets you kind of evolve on where you're at. So you don't get just stuck in the fact that this is what I deal with. What about, and, and then you can have a little more empathy for others even yeah. though, and those people that are missing one leg and one arm, woo, that's yeah, it's, something it's incredible. Itself. It's the inspiring people that are out there. I, I do agree. Well, Ronnie, I know we're coming close to our time to end here and I do want to end with a fun, silly game. If you are game. <laughs> okay. Makes me so a little nervous. But I'm going to give you two items and just off the top of your head, you don't need to really think about it because we're just going to kind of get to know your personality just a little bit more on the things that you like and don't like. So are you ready for it? I'm ready. Okay. Mountains or oceans? Mountains. Winter or summer? Winter. <laughs> Surprise. I know, right? <laughs> I know. Why I knew that those were going to be the first two that you'd pick. Coffee or tea person? Coffee. Add okay, it. No. Mm -hmm. Is it sugar, black? Is it foo-foo? Um, foo-foo, bit foo-foo. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I love the smell <laughs> of a good hot coffee, but I will not drink it. There's something yeah. about the smell. No, I have I'm my, the one that I have the, my, your, your specialty <laughs> drink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They yeah. know me by name at my local coffee house. Nice. <laughs> my husband's like, I'm not ordering that. You can yell across me. I'm like, okay, nice. All right. Are you a sweet or salty? Sweet. A night owl, um, but, but you know, I just told you, I can't have those sweets though. Remember? Cause they might, yeah, I, I might gain a pound. <laughs> well, that's, that's the problem. I'm a sweet person too. Are you a night owl or a morning person? Morning. I envy you. Um, would you say speaking or writing? Speaking, but involves both. So yeah, sure you does. can't do one without the other. Right. Right. Dramas or comedies? Comedies. All as right. long as they're not too raunchy, <laughs> I think right. comedy no can kidding. be funny. Right. Clean comedy is good. Yeah, I think so too. Life's drama enough. Um, would you say you're introvert or life of the party? Introvert. Um, home cooked meal or dining out? If I don't have to cook it, home cooked meal. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's the best of both worlds there. Um, and are you a movies person or a book person? book. Awesome. Thank you for playing little, yeah, little synapses of Ronnie Sasaki here. I am so honored to finally have you on my podcast mm -hmm. to get to know you, to call you a friend. I am proud of the journey you've been on and that you are speaking to those people, especially about your faith that, um, we need more of that. We so need more of that in this mm -hmm. world today. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of the show and for gifting us with your story. Oh, Angie, thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. Awesome. Until next time. All right.